Okay, uh, welcome uh, everybody. Welcome to everyone in the room, uh, the lucky few, uh, unfortunately, who are allowed in and welcome to the, the many who are um, taking part uh, online in the first uh, of what I hope will be uh, a series of hybrid King's uh, Maritime History Seminars. So just to remind uh, everybody where we are, we're being welcomed to the Department of War Studies, uh, the Lawton Naval History Unit within it, the Sir Michael Howard Center for Military History, King's College uh, London were the uh, hosts uh, for this uh, series of uh, seminars organized by the British Commission uh, for Maritime History uh, and with the long standing uh, support of the Society for Nautical uh, Research. Um, and also uh, Lloyd uh, Register. And of course, it's very exciting uh, to be here and to be here uh, in uh, person. Um, I also uh, want to just uh, make a note uh, that the British Commission uh, for Maritime History has decided to honor uh, the memory of Professor uh, Peter Davis, who died in 2020. Um, former chairman of the British Commission for Maritime uh, History, and of course, a very big uh, figure in uh, maritime history. He's had a, a huge influence on you know, economic history, maritime history, uh, and, uh, and, and, and so forth. Um, and with a, an incredible range um, he, he had. I'm not going now uh, to talk uh, about him uh, at great length, uh, or I'm not really in a position to pay tribute to him. There'll be opportunities uh, uh, for that. But I want to announce this is the first of what will be an annual uh, Peter uh, Davis uh, Memorial uh, uh, Lecture. Um, so to, you know, to honor uh, him, uh, and uh, the historian uh, and, the, and the man, but also to remind us about what this seminar series is all about. We get pulled in lots of different directions. We, we have papers, as, you, as many of you know, on all sorts of, of different things. And I think that's a, that's a good thing, uh, but the maritime and the economic uh, history uh, which was the, the ultimate purpose uh, of this series. We don't want to lose sight of. Uh, and so this is a good way uh, of uh, doing that. Uh, tonight, um, for the very first Peter Davis Memorial Lecture, uh, we have um, uh, Professor uh, Hugh Murphy, who is, uh, I think, uh, everyone will agree, um, uh, the most appropriate uh, speaker uh, to begin uh, this, this, this series of, of memorial uh, lectures. Most of you will know Hugh uh, already um, from his prolific output, from his participation, uh, well, in these in these seminars over over many years. Uh, but more important for his prolific uh, academic uh, output, uh, Hugh. For the people who don't uh, know him, had a um, a, a, a career uh, pre academia in in in, in engineering and shipbuilding. Um, he's a qualified mechanical uh, engineer, um, and he's held uh, cared fellowships at the National Maritime Museum over uh, in, in, in Greenwich. He's been the, a visiting reader uh, in maritime history there. He's won uh, accolades, of course, a co-winner of, um, of, uh, of the Anderson uh, Medal for Research in Maritime History, um, offered by the Society for Nautical uh, Research. Uh, the important thing, really, really, really impressive thing is, is the author of uh, eight books uh, and uh, chapters and articles uh, all over the place on all sorts of things. So he was an honorary professor of, of business history uh, in uh, the University of Glasgow, and he is better placed than I to speak about Peter Davis, uh, and he's best placed, of course, to offer this the first uh, lecture. And so, Hugh, I'm going to hand over for their thanks now to you. Thank you. Uh, Peter was a great friend of mine. Uh, he was a pioneer in the internationalization of maritime economic history. He was also my PhD examiner many years ago. And simultaneously with uh, Stig Tennant, now Stig is now Vice Chancellor academic affairs 
at the Norwegian School of Economics, and he would have loved to have been here, but unfortunately due to COVID and travel restrictions, he's not been able to make it. Peter was essentially a pragmatist, and in that light, I'll get on with it. <laughs> uh, as my late professor Derek Hoddy said to me, uh, we are doing a maritime history lecture, it must have pictures of ships, so there'll be some pictures of ships. <laughs> But I'll start, hopefully I can get this done in an hour. There's a lot of slides, so we'll do our best, okay? Uh, armchair philosophers, sarcastic sages, assorted malcontents, industrial voyeurs, and mainly Scottish business historians have all commented on the relative, then absolute decline of the British shipbuilding industry during the 20th century. An assembly industry characterized by a strictly demarcated labor rather than a capital intensive mode of production. In the voluminous academic literature, the declinist paradigm of senescence in light of international competition, in tandem with epic management failure, holds primacy. Nationalization, the transfer of a major branch of industry or commerce from private to state ownership or control has always been controversial in the United Kingdom. Indeed, the very late nationalization of the British shipbuilding in July 1977 was no exception to this general rule. Beforehand, several of the UK's major strategic heavy industries coal, iron and steel, railways and public utilities, water, gas and electricity were nationalized from 1946 to the early 1950s, only to be disastrously, disastrously returned to the private sector between 1979 and 1997. By the mid to late 1970s, it had become increasingly apparent that many of the industries nationalized between 1945 and 1951 were experiencing difficulties. The major problem being prolonged underinvestment and lack of modernization due to limited scope to raise capital and competition for scarce resources with other spending branches of government, such as health, social security, and education. Protection from competition as natural monopolies, management inertia, and institutional paralysis were ever present dangers and could lead to a culture of complacency as operating losses would be covered by the government, directly or indirectly through subsidies. Moreover, all nationalized industries were major employers in areas of a country prone to high unemployment. The fear of the state being responsible for making large numbers of workers redundant made most forms of rationalization politically difficult. Nationalization of the British shipbuilding industry by the Labour Party in July, government in July 1977 undoubtedly saved the bulk of the industry, but before discussing that period, it's necessary for context to discover what actually went up to it. Shipbuilding as an industry had never been nationalized, except for one company during the Great War. Ownership was a mixture of public and private limited liability companies, the latter mostly under family control. From the late 1950s onwards, failure to invest was paying out large sums in shared dividends and failure to modernize in mainly spatially constrained shipyards was apparent. During the 1950s, some 31 domestic firms were capable of building ships of 5,000 gross tons and over. <coughs> of these, only a trio of yards had the capacity to produce on an annual basis, tonnage approaching or exceeding 100,000 gross tons. In contrast, in 1958, when the post-1945 sellers market for British shipbuilding came to a jarring halt. Japan, who had overtaken Britain in tonnage launched in 1956, 
and thereafter retained first place for the remainder of the century at six yards capable of output exceeding 100,000 gross tons. West Germany had four, as had Sweden. In terms of concentration, from 1946 to 1955, half of all tonnage launched in British shipyards was delivered by just nine firms. As there were over 500 shipyards in Britain, the industry was atomistic and structured, largely foregoing standardization. Many privately owned concerns were controlled by long established families, seven generations in the case of Scott of Greenock and Stephen of Linthouse on the River Clyde. Modernization occurred far too late and was initially paid for by accumulated reserves and later by government grants and loans. Modernization was evidently needed as from 1945 to 1958, British shipyards as a whole invested around £8 million per annum on modernization. Split between 500 firms, this averaged £10,000 per annum. If averaged among the aforementioned 31 firms, each would spend around £259,000 per annum on modernization. Far too low a figure to meet in terms of competition. The following slides illustrate points made thus far, and I'll try and get the slides up to the end. The first one is uh, capital investment as a proportion of net output of shipbuilding and other industries in the UK, 1951 to 1950. I hope you can see that's a bit, uh, I couldn't figure out how to get to the right route. Yeah. But basically, shipbuilding and repair is the lowest, that's red, it's very difficult to see, but it's 4.6%. All manufacturing is 9.9%. .9%. Mechanical engineering is 8.5%. Electrical engineering, 7.5%. Motor vehicles and cycles, 12.2. Metal manufacturers, 14.5. And marine engineering, 7.2. So shipbuilding and repair, in terms of capital investment, as a proportion of net output, is the lowest among all these sectors. Next up is the share price index for manufacturing at October 1956. Uh, the December 1949 being 100. And uh, aircraft is 209, brewing 113, building 134, chemicals 204, electrical engineering 140, engineering 185, foodstuffs 163, motors 160, plastics 111, radio and television 230, rubber 157, textiles 140, tobacco 86 below the average of 1949, and shipbuilding at the top of the tree at 288. Now what does that tell us? It was a very good investment in the 1950s, particularly for the Spivs and Barrow boys in the city of London, who made a killing on shipbuilding shares. In the private companies, dividends of 25% were not uncommon and kept the owners and extended families in their country houses, sending the silence to public schools, owning expensive cars, etc., etc. It wasn't put back into the firms. And here's a point on technology. This is Lithgow Shipyard in Port Glasgow in the late 1950s. And you can see a horse in the background. Horses were widely used in the Clyde shipbuilding industry because they could go places where lorries could not. There were no roadways in the yards, especially in mud and rain and snow, etc. Teams of horses, 20 horses at a time, would carry ships' plates from the uh, outside the yard to all parts of the yard. And this is the last horse on the plate. Uh, I won't give him his name because the Empire of Woke will be having a go at me. But it was retired to the college, 
coaches out of the party chair at the age of nine years of age, which he, the horse was nine. Yeah? Uh, the shipbuilders during the Great War complained about the price of horses because so many were needed for the Western Front and other things. And uh, at the Battle of Verdun, for example, 7,000 horses were killed by shelling. In all, 8 million horses, donkeys, and mules were killed during the Great War. Uh, Britain had over 1 million horses in service in November 1918, but lost 480,000 through the Great War. So that's it. And you can see by looking at this, all the staging there, inherently dangerous, a lot of deaths, people falling off the sta staging to the day. The next one shows how spatially constrained shipyards were. And if you look at it closely, you can see outside, uh, I can't point it, but anyway, if you look at it closely, the main A road is running between the shipyard offices and the engine works. And the engine works can't go any further because the main Glasgow to clean up railway is behind it. Right? So they can't go out to sea, it's far too expensive, out to the River Clyde, it's far too expensive. And you can see the cramped nature of the deaths. Right? In contrast, here's Heimdall's yard at Luxan, built in a greenfield site, 1972. And you can see the huge amount of ships they're building at the same time in, in the dry dock. And basically, they're welded together prefabricated sections. And that's the difference. Okay, coming back to. Okay, it's a bit of a technical now. <laughs> if I can go back, I'll just talk to you. From the mid 1950s, British shipbuilding faced increasing competition particularly in the two growth sectors of international shipping, oil tankers and bulk carriers of increasing size in which to realize economies of scale. In these sectors, the industry had largely missed the boat. In Japan, at the Naval Yard of Curie, on a peppercorn rent, Daniel Ludwig, who retired as a billionaire through his national bulk carriers company, had brought American emergency all welded shipbuilding techniques to the building of bulk carriers and oil tankers. Post-1946, his yard acted as an industrial laboratory for other Japanese shipbuilders, so they learned all the techniques, who embraced the building dock method of construction, welding prefabricated sections of the hull together as the ship progressed with suitable cranage above. This gave Japan a leading tanker construction, which was not relinquished. In contrast, Scott of Greenock did not complete its first all welded tanker until 1956, and at Belfast, Harland and Wolf were still incorporating significant amounts of riveting in liner construction up to the 1960s. <coughs> Unsurprisingly, by 1965, British shipbuilding was failing the asset test of competitiveness, building for foreign accounts. This is percentage shares of the world export market in terms of, you can see this, can't you? And what you notice is Japan from a very low percentage of 48, was up to 38.8% in the period 61 to 65. Britain plunges, Germany goes up and down, Sweden again goes up, France goes up, yeah. But Britain from leading the world at that point, Straight 
Declining market share was, however, compensated something of by continuing to build for British ship owning companies until those companies, including oil majors, began to desert the industry from 1966 onwards. This coincided with a bizarre system of government investment grants to build ships of first 25% and then 20% of total cost, irrespective of whether these ships were built in British shipyards. All that was required to harvest these grants was a brass plate shipping company registered in London. Nevertheless, British ship owners have begun to desert the home industry on terms of a cheaper price, quicker delivery, and increasingly advantageous credit terms offered abroad. Unscrupulous foreign owners, mostly Greeks, took advantage of these grants to build surplus tonnage in British yards. By 1970, the exodus to build abroad had become apparent. If there was a discernible rationale for these grants, it was to have a modern British mercantile marine. Again. Okay. And this is ships delivered to the UK registered fleet in terms of time launched. And we can see. UK and foreign, again 48 foreign is nil, by 70, it's up to 74% of ships ordered by British ship owners are built in foreign yards. A terrible indictment for British ship owners, but they didn't care, they were getting the cheaper ships abroad. Investment grants were abandoned in 1970, but there remained a lag effect on construction and on a considerable amount of eligible contracts signed beforehand, as the following table shows. Again, this is not very clear, but I'll read it out. Um, of the total by 1970, um, from 1967 to 1977-78, the total amount in grant spent was 609 million pounds. Of that, 475 million pounds were for grants for ships built abroad and 132 million for ships built in the UK. So we're throwing money away on foreign yards. By the early 1960s, British shipbuilding was relegated to fourth place in output by Japan, West Germany, and Sweden, and thereafter remained under severe competitive pressure. Seven world famous companies, all major employers in the respective towns, including J. Samuel White of East Cows, builder of the first all welded destroyer, which was Seagull, liquidated. And this brought the government into play as the implications for employment were grim. These closures, given spatial limitations in these yards and the increasing dimensions of ships, were rational business decisions. But as usual, the workforces were the last to know of intended closure. In the case of Denny and Dumbarton, the workforce turned up for work after the land of holidays in 1963, only to find the gates of the yards shut and a notice of voluntary liquidation tended to them. Again, and these seven firms, I'll read them out. Uh, William Gray and Company at West Hartlepool in 1962, William Denny Brothers at the Barton, Harland and Wolf Govan and William Hamilton and Company, Paul Glasgow, all in 1963. In 1964, Short Brothers, Sunderland, and the Blythewood Shipbuilding Company at Scotstown, originally set up in 1920 as a tanker building yard. And in 1965, J. Samuel White at East Coast. Thank you. 
Post-1965, the Labour government believed that mergers and specialisation on the rivers Clyde, Tyne and Weir were the answers to the industry's ills. And post a shipbuilding required report in 1965-66, government set up a shipbuilding industry board to dispense grants and loans to achieve this. It might as well have thrown punch to elephants as the industry modernised far too late. 1970 saw the collapse of Camel Lair at Birkenhead, handily just before a general election, when it was saved by a Labour government who then lost the election to Ted to the Conservative Party. We can alert that still had a crane in its fitting out dock gained through reparations consequent upon the Treaty of Versailles after the Great War, which took 26 men to operate. According to one observer, the yard had industrial revolution technology and there was very little worth saving. This was one of British shipbuildings big six companies. 1971 saw the collapse of upper Clyde shipbuilders, a consortium from 1968 initially composed of five shipyards. One of them, Yarrow, through the Talleyrand of the Clyde, Sir Elliot Yarrow. As an aside, when Talleyrand died in 1838, Metternich is reputed to have said, I wonder what he meant by that. Through Yarrow's friends in the Conservative Party government, his firm exited from UCS for a nominal one pound before the latter went into liquidation in 1971. Yarrow had been the recipient of the only major item of capital expenditure being part of Upper Clyde Shipbuilders, a 1.5 million construction haul, and on leaving, were given a four and a half million pound loan by the Ministry of Defence friends in high places indeed. And now I can show you the last three passenger ways built in the UK, the Q2, built at John Brown at Clyde Bank. And here is a, a cruise liner built by Meyer West at Papenburg in September 2017 for the East Asian gambling market. It's basically just a big casino. Britain, of course, missed out on the cruise line and boom, there was nothing left to build it. In the wider economy, shipbuilding firms were dealt hammer blows through high rates of inflation during the 1970s, which at one stage reached 26%. In tandem with the organization of petroleum exporting companies, countries induced recession in Western economies post-1974, which quadrupled the price of the barrel of oil to $12 and led to a collapse in the very large crude carrier market and that of a major customer, maritime fruit carriers, which ruined overnight the profitability of a trio of yards set up to build crude carriers the money pit of Harland and Wolf at Belfast, Scott Lifkoe at Green in Port Glasgow, and Swan Hunter at Walls End in Kingsley. All as a matter of survival had taken on contracts at fixed prices in an inflationary climate, which resulted in huge losses. And there's the UK inflation side, and you can see up to 26%. You can see that. Round about in the late 1974 74. And here's Scott Lithgow's attempt at the very large group carrier market. Uh, they built a 250,000 deadweight ton tanker in two halves on a inclined sloping concrete mat. Straddled by the crane, you can see above, which is capable of lifting 225 tons. They never completed one in a year. Japanese and later Korean yards could do six. Yeah? And here's the other half. It was welded together on the specially constructed coffer dam, uh, and, that's how, and it's sold off. Given that the shipbuilding industry was rapidly approaching meltdown, the spectre, 
or depending on your political point of view, the nirvana of nationalisation became official Labour Party policy through the two general elections of 1964. The second of which gave the Labour government a majority of just two seats in Parliament. In 1974, Labour once again came to the rescue of a major shipbuilder, Court Line, saving 8,000 jobs, mainly on the River Weir, but not the travel and leisure interests of the Court Line growth companies, leading to a very large number of package holidaymakers in Strand abroad. So no change there then. With Camelwell 50% owned by the state, governed shipbuilders, the successor company to other flight shipbuilders, aided by 35 million pounds of government funds, wholly owned by the state, and court line shipbuilders, Doxford and Sunderland on the River Weir and Appledore and Devon, again wholly state owned, a substantial proportion of the industry was already nationalized. And here's the satirical magazine, Private Eyes, take on it in 1974, shipbuilding nationalized, and it says, Ben Overboard. That refers to Viscount Spansgate, who relinquished his title of the House of Lords in 1963 and became Queen Tony Ben, who was the Minister of Industry responsible for getting the nationalization project through in the first instance. Okay. As the slide implies, the portents for nationalization were not good. No other industry had failed to increase its absolute output in a period when world output had grown fourfold. No other industry, with the exception of the aircraft industry, even more useless, had received so much public finance and support, and shipbuilding would continue to need that support. Few other industries have failed to modernize and re equip to the disastrous degree of shipbuilding and ship sparing. The writing was on the wall, not ultimately from the Medes of the Persians, but specifically from the Japanese, who held over 60% of the tanker and bulk carrying market. Almost the exact percentage of world output British shipbuilding enjoyed in 1914. Enter stage left or right, whichever your political persuasion, as from 1974 onwards, with the industry on its knees, literally, there began an ideological dogfight in Parliament between the Labour government and the Conservative Party opposition. At its basis, nationalisation good, privatisation bad, and vice versa. Shipbuilding was not helped by being grouped with the aircraft industry for nationalization. In the House of Commons and in the sclerotic House of Lords, the paladins of Guano, the intellectually challenged and the term stupid, in short, a parcel of robes and a confederate of dunces, had a field day as the industry sank deeper into trouble. A future chairman of the nationalised industry, Graham Day, would later comment that the Conservative Party of Opposition behaved atrociously as the industry sank into near closure, only saved by the Labour government guaranteed to ship owners, how many, not many, that they would underwrite contracts in the event of nationalisation. One shipyard owner, Sir William Lithgow, Ted Heath's industrial advisor in Scotland railed against nationalisation, stating, quote, what a poor dead substitute is the phony paternalism of the giant corporation. What hypocrisy will next be perpetrated in the name of public accountability, unquote. Lifko stated much earlier than a certain Mrs. Thatcher that the public interest is merely the sum of individual interests and that there's no substitute for being personally accountable to each other and called for a cultural revolution, presumably not in the Chinese model, to save Britain. What we got was a giant leap backwards. As the parliamentary tussle intensified, 
a British Shipbuilders Organising Committee was formed in 1976 with a former controller of the Navy, Admiral Anthony Griffin, zero commercial experience as chairman and a Canadian lawyer and managing director from 1970 onwards of Camel Webb at Birkenhead, Graham Day as chief executive designate. Day asked 27 shipyards for their corporate plans. He got one, his own from Carmel Webb. They then publicly stated that his first priority would simply be survival. But he and a trio of his supporters would throw their toys out of the cram and depart the organizing committee by the end of 1976, leaving a committee of two, including Adam Griffin. Subsequently, a civil servant, Michael Casey, who apart from his family, no one had ever heard of, and with no industry experience, took the chief executive position, and a number of civil servants from the Department of Industry also joined the organizing committee. After years of parliamentary struggle, this is going from 74 to 77, a number of ship repair firms were omitted from the legislation in the spring of 1977, and the bulk of the industry, minus the money pit to Parliament and Wolf at Belfast, but including the major engine builders employing over 86,000 workers, in total, and many more of the multiplier effect on suppliers and local commercial interests considered were nationalised under the British Shipbuilders Corporation on 1st of July 1977. Sweden, so often heralded as an exemplar of modern shipbuilding techniques, also nationalised the bulk of its shipbuilding industry in 1977, owing to disastrous foreign currency losses of two major firms, Eric Spiller and Walter Durkin. And you can see from that, oh yeah. so in 1st of July 1977, the shares of 27 companies and the subsidiaries engaged in shipbuilding, slow speed diesel main engine manufacturing and allied industries were vested in the British Shipbuilding Corporation. The further six independent ship repair companies has to be nationalized post July. The corporation were, however, unhappy with this and brought in consultants in the hope that they would find that bringing in ship repair was a bad idea. The consultants, AP Appledore International, duly reported against expectations, and ship repair became a division of the corporation. Normally, consultants rubbish previous consultants and tell their employers only what they want to hear. This was a real exception and would later prove hugely costly for the corporation. Ship repair had always been casualized. No work, no pay. However, under the corporation, ship repair workers were paid an idle time allowance for being non-productive. <laughs> In addition, one more shipbuilding firm, Hales of Shipbuilding of Trinity was added in June 1978. By then, as you can see, the corporation accounted for 97% of British merchant shipbuilding capacity, 100% of washout, 100% of slow speed diesel manufacturing, and approximately 50% of ship capacity. Yeah. From July 1977 to March 1978, the corporation employed on average some 86,600 employees. 44,800 of which were employed for merchant and mixed naval construction, 20,000 on specialized warship construction, 8,500 in ship repair, 5,600 in marine engine building, and 7,700 in general engineering and other activities. Of the 86,600 employees, 24,000 were in Scotland and the rest in England. <clears throat> Given the fiasco of the organizing committee, 
the continued par parliamentary opposition up to March 1977, and the late cobbling together of a new committee, the corporation was initially set up with no common financial reporting system or common plan, save that it to be loosely arranged into four sectors. Merchant shipbuilding, warship building, ship repair, and marine and general engineering. Crucially, with the exception of owners who now left the industry and sought compensation for their shareholdings at 1974 share values, its constituent companies were still being run by the same managerial cadre who had presided over the near collapse funding of the industry under private control. With the managing directors of two of the largest composite warship and mercantile shipyards, Ross Belt, Scott Liftall, and Tom McIver, Swan Hunter, appointed deputy chairman of the corporation. The advent of nationalisation in British shipbuilding came as a relief to most firms. Many were ordering on the cliff edge of bankruptcy and closure. Indeed, as a future corporation chairman, Robert Parkinson stated, quote, for all practical purposes, many of our subsidiary companies were insolvent on vesting day in 1977, and others became insolvent later as a consequence of continuing losses, unquote. The decision by headquarters to treat the corporation's subsidiary companies as individual profit centers under a decentralized management system was a cataclysmic error for politicians passing the map. They allowed the local management, especially the costly and wholly inefficient warship building firms, who had merrily been ripping off the British taxpayer throughout the century and who operated under conditions of imperfect competition, to basically ignore the centre in the day to day running of their firms. From the outset, the warship building firms were only nominally a part of the corporation and seemed to think that they could function independently and were encouraged to do so by the Ministry of Defence, who wanted to keep the chimera of competition alive, despite political imperatives to ignore value for money when it suited government to do so. They had dealt exclusively with the MOD's predecessor in Admiralty from 1889 to 1964, and why it changed now. Decentralization only reinforced this stance. Loans from the corporation to profit centers would attract interest paid back to it. It was agreed through the corporation acting finance director that centralized banking would be undertaken, and that all subsidiary companies should remit their cash balances to headquarters in London. Subsidiaries such as Boss Performance Roth, who, like Yarrow and Vickers, had fought hard against nationalization, had £50 million in the bank. Similarly, all other subsidiaries followed, and this instantly made headquarters deeply unpopular. The finance director, Michael Haynes, attempted to highlight that though that those subsidiaries were no longer in control of their own destiny. After all, it was a nationalized undertaken. And from now on, investment decisions would be generated and approved centrally. One might ask why did firms have such large cash balances and why they had not been largely dissipated prior to nationalization, particularly in the private companies. This was in fact anticipated in the legislation to establish the corporation from 1974 onwards when first introduced by Parliament. Section 35 of the Aircraft and Shipbuilding Industries Act provided for compensation to the original owners via government bonds against the valuation of the shares over a relevant period of six months up to the general election on 28 February 1974. Section 39 of the Act included a provision to make deductions from the base value if a firm had dissipated its assets by declaring dividends in anticipation of nationalization or, quote, by other means. Crucially, only those firms still trading would receive compensation. 
Hence, the sheer scale of accumulated losses and overmined prior to nationalization. Although profit centers were expected to pay dividends to the corporation, this was quickly abandoned by March 1978 as the recession in shipbuilding deepened. By then, the corporation's chief executive, Michael Casey, increasingly saw the industry in a fight for survival. And shipyards worldwide selling ships at well below the cost of producing them. As Green Day later commented, Britain played cricket where everyone else played rugby league. The corporation attempted to bring its constituent companies under a standardized system of financial reporting, impose cash limits, and monitor production through audit of individual yards, which was also deeply popular. This was always necessary for the corporation to keep within the financial limits imposed by the government. From the beginning, the dichotomy between centralization and decentralization led to indecision, duplication of effort, rising costs, and incoherence, particularly with marketing, which should have been centralized as an issue. Clearly, the complexity of the corporation's task to coordinate, organize, and reform a fragmented industry would take some considerable time amid a continued recession in world shipbuilding. No industry would come through unscathed. Originally based in Knightsbridge, London, to be close to government, the corporation subsequently moved its headquarters to Newcastle upon Tyne in the Jordan Nation. However, most of the real decisions early on were made in London, and travel costs between the two centres of operation were considerable, and too much use was made of the corporation's airplane. The increased demands on government and supervision of subsidiaries meant headquarters staff grew as did costs. Moreover, many HQ staff were new to shipbuilding and had to learn fast. Had the corporation posted a profit in its first reporting year, given what has already been outlined, it would have been nothing short of miraculous. In the event in the financial reporting period from 1st of July 77 to 31st of March 1978, the corporation posted a trading loss, as you can see in the slide, of 108 million before tax after crediting shipbuilding intervention fund monies. Unsurprisingly, a substantial part of that loss, 47 million pounds, arose from contracts taken before nationalization. It's a pretty grim picture. Uh, it might not seem a lot given the huge corporate losses today, but these were really substantial losses at the time. Yeah? And so, <clears throat> given the perilous market situation in terms of the shipbuilding intervention fund, originally intended to be a temporary solution, it went on for years. To bridge the price gap between East Asian competition, the first tranche in February 1977, £65 million, was raised to £85 million in 1978, subject to annual negotiations with the European community. Remember, we had joined in 1975, four years ago, we did join the earlier referendum in with the aid of the Shipbuilding Intervention Fund, the corporation broadly concentrated on survival by attempting to weather the storm of international competition and reduce demand in the hope that demand would once again pick up in the early 1980s. This was almost exactly the position taken by the European Commission up to and throughout the 1980s and beyond. However, the Commission subsidized in the hope of an improving market while simultaneously reducing capacity in the expectation that it would not. As Bo Straff noted, the two positions were mutually compatible. It was the emphasis which had changed over time from the first to the second. At a meeting with chief executives in July 1978, Michael Casey unsurprisingly noted that many of the corporation's problems thus far 
were as a result of resistance to change. Change was inevitable for the industry, which was virtually bankrupt, were to regain viability. In October, Casey decided to place members of headquarters staff on a non-executive basis on the boards of subsidiary companies. In letters to chief executives, he stressed that this would largely assist communications in the broadest sense and would improve headquarters' perceptions of the problems of subsidiary shipyards. And in consequence, the centre would be better informed on taking decisions that affected them and vice versa. The view of subsidiary firms is not on well, this is not a problem, but if past attitudes were any guide, acceptance of corporation members or boards would be at best lukewarm and more probably utterly resented. In essence, what was needed was more order to buy time. Enter the Polish ship's order. In December 1976, when the bill to establish the corporation was still in dispute in Parliament, the Prime Minister, by default, James Callahan, and his Polish communist counterpart issued a joint communique to build ships for Poland and British shipyards. Never a good idea to announce this before a contract was signed. Late in 1977, negotiations were, at, negotiations were at an advanced stage between the corporation and the Polish government about an order of 22 cargo vessels and two crane ships worth around 150 million pounds. You wouldn't be getting the off for that nowadays. To secure the business, the British government agreed to give a subsidy from the Shipbuilding in Intervention Fund of not more than £28,000. The corporation provided finance to the joint venture company, not with public funds, but with the aid of Hamburg's bank by borrowing on the commercial market a euro dollar loan of £65 million, approximately £35 million. Pounds. No British seamen would be deployed, and as part of the deal, 10 of the engines and all the chains and anchors, propellers and shafts would be manufactured in Poland, with decks supplied by Norwegian firms. A jointly owned company, Anglo-Polish Ship Adventures Limited, incorporated in Poland, was set up, and the ships would eventually trade in the Baltic Sea on a 15-week charter. However, despite agreements with the Confederation of Shipbuilding and Engineering Unions, the Polish deal was threatened by an overtime ban and support pay parity by, with boilermakers imposed by 1,700 members of the outfit trades at Swan Hunter at Brooks End, who had been promised several of the Polish ships. The corporation was a precondition to place in the Polish order in their various merchant yards required trouble from production. Workers at Austin and Pickersgill on the River Weir, in solidarity with their time counterparts, had refused to accept any reallocated ships from Swan Hunter. In the end, after a 12 week delay, hoping that the Swan Hunter situation would be resolved, Govan shipbuilders and successive company to upcoin shipbuilders agreed by February 1978 to take the reallocated ships after Govan trade union short stewards had been appraised of Confederation of Shipbuilding Engineering Policy. At a mass meeting of 3,000 workers, only four were convinced. So much for workers' solidarity shipbuilding. Subsequently, Govan delivered 13 Polish ships in two and a half years despite these ships in the wrong size for their facilities, which led to losses due to underreported overheads. The Polish deal highlighted just how bad the situation was for the corporation. As the Secretary of State for Industry, Eric Valley stated, quote, what we have done is war of disaster, but we have not yet found a cure, unquote. Had not the Polish order been secured, then yard closures and subsequent unemployment would have been inevitable and would have sunk nationalization before it really got off the ground. The Poles certainly got a good deal. 
underlying the industry's problems was its abysmal record on productivity. That is, efficiency in production of goods measured by the rate of output per weight of input. In British shipbuilding, there had been no growth in output since 1955. And the industry subsequently performed purely in terms of international comparison. All British shipyards have paired management structures, and very few of any production planning departments were the only name. The only real measure of productivity was the ship itself. With the standard method of productivity being output per man per steel ton in home construction. Given the huge levels of subcontracting when the ship was being outfitted, overall productivity measures taking this part of the production process into account were extremely difficult to achieve. Prior to nationalisation, bogus productivity deals to get around government pay restraint policies were widespread. And throughout the corporation's history, including a one day survey, which found that 3.5 hours of the standard eight hour working day were not productive, the search for productivity gains mirrored that of the Holy Grail and was just as elusive. Moreover, given the dire market situation, the workforce were hardly likely to work themselves out of the job. And you can see Britain at the bottom of the pile, as usual. Uh, very poor. <clears throat> Sweden at the top. And again, I reiterate, Swedish shipbuilding was nationalized in 1977. Just as the Labour Party had promised to nationalize shipbuilding in its two general election manifestos in 1974, then the Conservative Party, all too predictably, did the reverse in the 1979 general election manifesto. According to the putative Prime Minister, Margaret Thatcher, subsequently the gross mediocrity in a hero's garb, who posed as a Conservative, but in reality was a 19th century liberal, quote, more nationalisation would further impoverish us and further undermine their freedom. Freedom's always a big word for the conservatives, but they don't believe in it. We will offer to sell back to private ownership the recently nationalized aerospace and shipbuilding concerns, giving their employees the opportunity to profit shares. The latter was linked to the establishment of a massive political contract of a property or democracy by giving British people, quote, the right to buy town and city council social housing, a gross act of political gerrymandering which Mrs. For, Mrs. for which Mrs. Thatcher was never held to account. Over one million council tenants purchased their council houses at a 70% discount, leading to a disastrous shortage of council houses in future years and leaving the poorer sections of the population to the average of rotations Rachmanite landlords and private rented accommodation, and to underqualified chances from housing associations on huge salaries. As to shareholdings and what were previously owned nationalised concerns, the chimera was that small investors, that is, the vast majority of members of the public who subscribe to shareholders in newly, in newly, national, newly privatised companies, would actually have a say in how they were run when shareholdings were dominated by institutional investors, banks, insurance companies, et cetera, who were given preferential treatment in the volume of share offers prior to the sale to the general public. By promising to reintroduce private finance into British shipbuilders, the election of the Conservative government in May 79, under Mark Thatcher, heralded an eventual sea change for the industry. Initially, however, policy remained much as the economy before, as at this stage, there was not much point in privatizing a lost industry. However, a change at the top of the corporation was imminent. In a break with the past under Labour, the chairman, Admiral Griffin, the chief executive, Michael Casey, 
left the corporation the 16th of May and 30th of June 1980, respectively. They were replaced in both roles by the more hard nosed Robert Atkinson, then chairman of the Sheffield Steel firm Aurora Holdings, who was appointed on 6th of May 1980. Atkinson had been a former engineering director of William Doxford and Sons Shipbuilders and Engineers in Sunderland from 1958 to February 1961, but in later life was highly critical of that company and shipbuilding management generally. His later observations made on docks for management may have and probably did give him a prior job dispute of what he'd be up against in taking the chair of the corporation. Quote, this is about the doctor. There was a lethargic lot in charge who really behaved disgracefully. They lived the life of barons, the life of luxury, but did nothing intellectually or financially to push their country forward. Atkinson's views on Doxford were, in my opinion, highly relevant to the interests of the large prior to the national organization. Redundancies of yard closures were now firmly on the agenda as the corporation attempted to weather the storm of international competition. Voluntary redundancies with state compensation had been ongoing and it was decided that all workers over 65 years of age would be compulsively retired. At nationalization in 1977, Camel had, uh, wait for it, 800 workers over the age of 70. Accordingly, when they left the yard, so too did a huge part of the institutional memory. On industrial relations from July 1977 to the end of 78, the industry was subject to a Gordian knot of 168 separate collective, collective bargaining agreements on wages and salaries. By 1st of January 1979, it was subject to one with a single negotiating bid, a remarkable achievement, but one which also reflected the gravity of the competitive position. However, an agreement on no compulsory redundancies negotiated with Blackpool did not last long. Atkinson, after excoriating the current management, attempted to reorganize the corporation by taking two of its huge loss-making yards Camel Laird and Scott Liverpool into a new offshore division to build a semi submersible drilling rigs, an area of activity not subject to shipbuilding intervention or assistance, in which they were jointly very ill equipped to be successful, and so it proved. With one semi submersible rig, Ocean Alliance, proving to be the most disastrous contract ever undertaken. British shipbuilding at Scott Lifted. With the re election of the Thatcher government in 1983, privatization of the corporation's remaining shipyards, particularly its warship division, was now firmly on the agenda. Atkinson would later relate to the permanent secretary of the Department of Industry, Sir Peter Willoughby Kerry told them that Mrs. Thatcher wanted rid of shipbuilding. Moreover, the utterly useless Secretary of State, Norman Lamont, despite his Frenchifying of his name to Lamont, the Scots Gallic and the lawman, only seemed to be happy when told of impending yard closures and redundancies, stating to another corporation director, quote, Margaret would be happy. Thatcher had by this stage prioritized, prioritized monetary policy to control inflation over the control of unemployment, which peaked at over 3 million, 3 million souls paid largely by North Sea oil taxation. Scotland got very little from oil revenues and got the poll tax in 1989, one year ahead of the world Wales. And um, here's the unemployment stats. That's the, uh, yeah. no, the first one, yeah. yeah. And we can see uh, during the Thatcher years, unemployment never returned to its 1979 level. 
and uh, 84, 85, 86, uh, 83, usual levels of unemployment. But that's not the real figure. The real figure was something over 5 million. People just didn't want to stop. Next one. Thank you. And here's the shipbuilding uh, in Europe comparison. And, uh, and we can see from that 73% of the UK workforce disappeared in 1975 and 1984. Unsurprisingly, given continuing heavy losses, Robert Atkinson gave way to Graham Day, who it will be recalled, and left the organizing committee in 1976. Day's brief was simple, privatized the warship firms by May 1986 at the latest, which he achieved. An attempt to privatize the remaining mercantile firms, all of which were huge loss Ironically, the first privatization was that of the corporation's biggest loss maker, Scott Lifko, sold in March 1984 for 12 million pounds to Trafalgar House PLC, owners of the canal shipping line, the Conservative Party supporting national newspaper, the Daily Express, whose headquarters in Fleet Street was known as the Black Lubyanka, and numerous other businesses, including hotels, and headed by Margaret Thatcher's favorite businessman, Matt Brooks. Scott Lithgow closed for good in 1990, and Camelwell was sold for one pound to Vickers, and subsequently had nine lives, and much reduced, is still with us just. In little over a decade, the industry had gone from private to state control and largely back to private control again. The privatization of the only profitable part of the, corpor the corporation, the firms in its warship division, to which had been added two small, vastly undercapitalized firms, Brook Marine and Lowestoft and Hall Russell Aberdeen, left an unprofitable lump of mercantile firms, all of which with the exception of Northeastern Shipbuilders Limited on the River Weir, was subsequently privatized by 1990. When Northeastern Shipbuilders Limited closed after a succession of blatant lies by Conservative minutes in Parliament as to their true intention, thereafter the corporation remained as a shell company to deal with insurance claims. Some £2 billion pounds had been expended by the state through a succession of industry ministers. Seven from 1979 to 1989, who plainly, much like the current lot, were not up to the job and were only interested in scaling the degrees and call of political preferment. The Lady Lord's Horse and Maker Beth are Prime Minister in the current narcissist in post. As to ministers responsible for shipbuilding, as the old political bruiser Dennis Healy remarked of one Secretary of State, Sir Keith Joseph who provided Margaret Thatcher's intellectual ballast, quote, he was a mixture of Hamlet, Rasputin, and Tommy Cooper. For our international audience, Cooper was a fez wearing comedian and skilled magician who continually got magic tricks wrong in his act. Another Secretary of State who ushered in privatization, the chin for the skinhead, Norman Tebbit, a former airline pilot and union negotiator for the British Airline Pilots Association saw no irony whatsoever when in government in condemning restrictive practices, which he had previously supported with Bristol. Another Lord Younger Grafton was given the name of Lord Soot by the satirical magazine The Friend Night and was just as useless. Had they all got on the bikes and paddled over the cliff, the industry would have been better off as with the nation. Privatization of the warship firms meant one form of dependency was replaced by another. They remained utterly dependent on the decreasing level of Ministry of Defense warship contracts. Taken together with a marked falling off in the export market for warships, this influenced the prices prospective buyers of the warship firms were willing to pay. Accordingly, the corporation lost £248 million on the sale of warship firms. In short, the book value of net assets had departed from economic reality. In summation, the industry in private hands prior to nationalisation 
apart from the holy intercession process of worship films, Yarrow, Prosper, Formico, and Vickers performed disastrously, and disastrously against weathering international competition, particularly from Japan and latterly from South Korea. By 1988, eight Korean shipyards were building as many ships as a total of 67 shipyards in Europe. Most British shipyards would not have survived if not for nationalisation, which only prolonged the agony of an industry on a one-way ticket to Palookaville. Industrial Darwinism was not contemplated as employment considerations won out of an economic reality. Nationalisation plainly did not work, and neither did subsequent privatisation, which eventually ushered in what the Ministry of Defence had always fought against, a monopoly supplier of submarines and frigates, EEP systems. By 1990, British shipbuilding output was statistically irrelevant. The winners, the Japanese and South Koreans, who understood the nature of capitalism better, and had calculated that staying in the market, aided by the respective governments, despite huge losses, would eventually eliminate competition. And when the upturn in the market came, they would be best placed to exploit it. And so it went. I will finish with the observation of a former British shipbuilders director of corporate planning, Martin Stockford, applicable to the entire period of nationalization. He later noted that he had to come up with a plan and incorporate some argument to explain why the corporation had failed to deliver previously and to show scenes of improvement. In this regard, he noted that, quote, the yards would perennially send us a load of rubbish about their performance next year. They never did perform in that way because they were in a market where they could not perform. Thank you. Thank you. Good. Right. Thank you very much. And thank you, everybody uh, in the room and at home for um, uh, your um, patience with the, with the technology, which I think we're uh, getting the hang of. And this is where it really comes into its own, because people in the room can ask questions and the technology will follow the voice. Yeah. And you at home, you can put up your hand and you can ask a question and you appear to the people uh, in the room. It's, it's, the, it's the new age. And I wonder if, uh, you know, while, while, while we're starting, well, could I, I I'm going to take chairs, chairs uh, prerogative uh, here. Yeah. Uh, Hugh, you didn't disappoint. We all expect you to tell us exactly uh, what you think. And you did that uh, very well. Um, what I'm seeing here is 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 um, private firms that didn't work and nationalization which didn't work and then reprivatization which didn't work. So uh, I'm I'm wondering if there's a if, if uh, what in other words is the is is should have happened. In other words, I mean I know that Korea and Japan are held up as as, as examples. I don't know is, was that a a realistic. Uh, model to, to, to follow, or was there uh, a, another model? No, because it, it wasn't realistic in the sense that we hadn't modernized well enough to compete. And by the time we did modernize, it was too late. And, uh, those seven firms which packed it in between 1962 and 65, these were rational business decisions. The spatially constrained yards, ships in, were being built in increasing dimensions. They didn't want to pay for modernization. They took their money and the money. Yeah? Yeah, and the workforce would just pay for them. But they didn't get the money as it was because it was casual. So they were out with no money. You know? And had to wait for the money. Uh, now, my view is the entire industry should have packed it in back in the 60s. They couldn't compete with the Japanese. All they really had to do, information was king. Look at the Lloyd's register. See how many ships have been built. You can't compete. Overall, you just cannot compete. So, and as Martin Stockford says at the end, they were in the market and they could not compete on stage. What the government did was basically prioritize employment over the 
Okay, Neil, I jumped in front of you, so. Uh, yes, well, thank you. And, uh, and, uh, I'm glad you made your Christian view so abundantly clear, because yeah. um, uh, it might have been in some doubt. Yeah. <laughs> Explained so carefully. Um, no, I, 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 as a matter of fact, I'm just going to make this very point that I think you wrote your just last answer in about um, employment. If the government is prioritizing employment, which essentially is the point, isn't it, that you are describing a situation where in the 1950s it was fair to support an industry to keep people in employment and surprise, surprise the investors or owners thought, well, we'll have a bit of that. Yeah. And, uh, you know, they are acting in self interest. And I think this is, you know, the, st the story of any kind of government and any kind of kind of yeah. business model. Oh, the industry were absolutely adept to getting in touch with government, saying we're making 10,000 people redundant if you don't give us a new quarter. And they did it, they did it all the time. Yeah. Yeah. Sure. Uh, this and the government fell for every time. Yeah, it goes back to the 1920s and the 1930s when you had the old assisted areas act. Which basically means uh, areas of high unemployment. Yeah? Glasgow wasn't the one, but the lower clay that we know called Glasgow was. So these firms got two and a half percent in regional employment premium yeah, on the thing. And the other big trick in shipbuilding, of course, was to factor in strikes. Yeah? So you would add on a couple of months to every contract just for strikes or demarcation. Was Standard, right? Then you would claim that there was a heavy shower, you claim a force majeure event and say, Oh, we couldn't work in that day. You know, there was a slight breeze, you know, anything to explain weight delivery. You know? uh, this, is, this is what went on. You know? Is there anybody out there in the cyber world who would like to test Hugh and to test the technology by asking a question? Right, we have Dean, who I'm going to allow to talk. Now, Dean, you can also turn on your uh, camera if you like. If you'd like to be the, the very first. <laughs> um, and you may have to demute yourself, yes. Are you there? <laughs> okay. Um, Dean, interrupt us whenever you think you are able, because I believe I've done all that I can to give you the permissions that you need. What's what? Is, is there a way for you to set, the ball, set his volume, not just the mute? Uh, I can turn this volume. Uh, but I am worried because we had that uh, yeah. test in. Um, chat. We'll get all those stuff. Yeah. Really okay. Is. So he sent his, his apologies. Um, and uh, this is a, 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 a nice note, uh, Hugh, yeah. that you might not notice that Maureen and Simon Davis are listening from Rio oh, and from Toronto, respectively. You did notice that. Well, that's. Uh, Hello, Simon. Hello, Maureen. Yeah. Um, and there's one. Um, uh, now, Neil or Niall, if you'd like to, if you'd like to, I mean, I mean, you will answer that question, I'm sure, but if you'd like to uh, participate, unmute yourself and turn on your, your camera, you're welcome to. You want me to answer I that? want you to answer that. Yeah. Are you talking about the corporation's overall losses? Uh, that would include under recovered the uh, overheads, uh, lost provisions, which if they weren't taken and put back to the profit and loss account for the following year. Uh, wages in British shipbuilding were not that great. So it wasn't, a, what we're talking about is losses for late delivery and penalty clauses, basically. That, that was the, the major factor in the whole corporation's losses. It would be quite simple for one firm to lose 25 million a year simply because they hadn't done it within time. And there was clauses, penalty clauses in the original contract. 
I think Dean is asking a question this way because he's having technical problems of oh, his own, which aren't ours, which is actually quite, quite a nice thing uh, for me. Uh, um, uh, may have covered it already, uh, but the cyclical nature of shipbuilding in the UK and how do you see US and UK cyclical challenges and opportunities for pipelines on fleet needs? Well, shipbuilding has always been subject to booms and slumps and demand. Um, in the biblical term, seven years of feast and seven years of famine, it was inherently a cycle. The point was to survive in that time. Um, I can't answer the question on pipelines, only to say that Harland and Wolf have been resurrected in Belfast. Uh, to do pipe work for a gas storage facility at Island maybe in Northern Ireland. So that's all I can say on that. Yeah, I, yeah. I, I, I think I, I, I butchered Dean's question, I'm afraid, because it came in, 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 in bits. So apologies uh, for that. Um, and yes, uh, Stig, you uh, are there, and it is very good to see uh, people uh, here. I, I'll just say, you know, for, for the moment, this is a this is a trial um, uh, physical audience. In the in the in the future, um, I'm hoping we'll be able to have uh, the full lot of people here and uh, and at home. Uh, but you're participating. There's, in there's two other aspects of this, right? And that's a way you have the state would shut the Thin County in, which is now the fourth largest ship in the world. They're still growing. They've even bought a couple of American ship you know? um, And Russia, of course, kept a ship building at this time. Right? Uh, have you got time and I'll do yeah, it? Yeah, yeah. Russia. Does anyone you know, consider what by the work that things doing at the moment? No? Okay. Let's see if uh, it's like. <laughs> you might wonder why that's there, but I'm going to tell you. Yeah. Russia, for strategic reasons, kept its shipbuilding industries intact post the collapse of the Soviet Union, and the bulk of the industry is now under the state owned enterprise, United Shipbuilding Corporation, whose board members are under sanctions by the United States. Just how much the Russian kleptocracy is interested in shipbuilding was recently highlighted by Putin's press secretary, Dmitry Peskov's then 19-year-old daughter, Yelizaveta Peskova. In a flat in Paris. Amazing what we can do on a <laughs> press sportsman's salary, isn't it? Miss yeah. Peskova, who apparently studied marketing in Paris, Hence, a Blitzley department there gave a speech, which she was manifestly unqualified to do, to a group of workers in the shipyard in Russian occupied Crimea. Miss Peskova, whose talents knows no bounds, had also visited that bastion of individual liberty, Chechnya, at the invitation of its dictator. Ramzan Kadarov. The dress she wore at the Sebastopol shipyard in the middle of two salty looking dudes was designed by Kadarov's daughter. The advisor worked together with the day job. A couple of quotations will suffice to highlight Miss Peskova's blinding insight on shipbuilding. Quote I don't know a single person who would even imagine that there are people who build ships. <laughs> and this is Jen. Younger Russians needed to be taught that shipbuilding, quote, is nothing to be ashamed of. <laughs> As Putin's foremost critic, the now incarcerated Alexei Navalny, has observed, quote, a new star has finally appeared on the horizon of our government's feudal personal politics. Thank you. <laughs> Very good. Um, now, um, 
I don't know if we want to try Dean's question again, okay, but uh, I'll, I'll just read it what you're going to have to do is, I, I think the best thing for you to do is to, is to start from uh, yeah. from there and scroll down and read it short. Uh, so, so, really, yeah. really question there. Uh, yeah. No. Okay. Uh, you can read it or summarize it. With value, although you may have already covered cycle nature of shipbuilding in the UK. Yeah. Okay. And, and how do you see US and UK cyclical challenges and opportunities for pipelines and fleet needs, which is where we left you, and attracting newer talent on engineering? Well, I'm going to say, unsurprisingly, I'm going to be a bit critical of the United States. Health of, yeah. I.e., the health of nautical and naval engineering supply chains for talent under, un, understood and does 3D model, modeling capability, that is, computer modeling, engineering help on. Be to need for production. <laughs> Sorry, Dean, I, I do apologize. I think I can help with that. Okay. Shipbuilding now is unrecognizable from what it was in the 70s. Yeah. Uh, computer generated modeling of ships. And Roy Metcalf, there is an expert in this. And uh, you can visualize the entire ship, uh, the sequences of the ship, uh, the, employ the employment needed for certain things. Uh, the whole inventory, everything. This can all be done by computer. It used to be done by just one manager looking at ship and telling people what to do. But now all this is done uh, algorithmically in some cases, isn't it? Really? Yeah. Uh, so shipbuilding has moved on a great deal. Um, as, but now when you see, and this is, say, uh, BEA systems, when they're thinking of building a new frigate, they'll give you this wonderful model on it. And there's best no relation at all to what they actually build, but it looks good and it gets government to put the money in. Yeah. But America, in terms of shipbuilding, is always been protectionist, high cost, and basically through the Jones Act, reserve all cabotage, which is coastal shipping, to be built in American shipyards. They never owned it. Uh, in terms of Britain, what we had a few years ago was the Ministry of Defence actually ordering ships from South Korea and shipyards. Uh, there were uh, fleet deployments from tankers. Now uh, there had been a huge fury over that in the 70s, but it barely passed the muster. And actually, the Koreans delivered on the time. Yeah? They then spent about a year of filming. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. But this has always happened because it's the difficulty in building a broader supervision. As, you know, how do you adequately supervise the language problems, there's currency problems, there's a whole crash. Yeah. The whole point of the building in Britain is you were dealing with sterling, right? If you're ordering a ship in, say, uh, France, right? If currency goes against you, you could be looking at huge losses. Yeah. Whereas in Britain, no, the losses are going to be on the main location. So, uh, I can't really answer this question, but I think I'm going to take Okay, that, that'll yeah. do. There's another one here by Angie uh, 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 Pertrude. Uh, I, I, I must say, uh, you cyber people, you people at home, I'm, I'm disappointed by your reluctance yeah, to try out the technology and to uh, speak and to turn on your, 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 your cameras. Um, I'm assuming this applies to you. Andy, so I will read out your question, but it would be much better if you asked your, own, your, your questions directly, I think. That's just a general um, comment to everyone else. Was the decision to decentralize under nationalization informed by the experience of other nationalized industries like coal and the frustrations uh, with centralization? That's the, that's the question. No. No. Uh, Right, and I'm going to invite you to read uh, read all, all of your comments in, in succession um, afterwards. Um, thanks. Okay. I mean, even even if somebody out there wanted to thank you personally by unveiling themselves and saying so with their own voice, then I would <laughs> they'd be happy. Who who would like to do that? Just raise your raise your hand. 
Okay, for some people they can't. Okay, Stig can't. They, uh, Dean is trying again. Yeah, I'm, I apologize. I'm just having some block, but I'm happy to say thank you. Although I missed some of the lecture, I was really appreciative that you guys allowed me to tune in and follow some. Good, thank you. Thank you. Yes. Uh, Dean, you can tune in. Yeah, the, yeah. Uh, my question is, how did successive governments manage to pull the European Commission on the matter of state aid? You're talking about the Shipping Bank, yes. That was actually a paper commission on the year before. Uh, one year commission of that was about four year gold program or subsidies. Yeah. So each individual country had a winner, yeah. of course, looking global. But in the case of Britain, by the 1980s, the shipbuilding intervention fund was, was half in years because the ships built abroad are so much cheaper than we've not had. So, so it wasn't used at all. Originally, it was a good idea. Uh, and the European Commission agreed to it Britain uh, had no growth in output at all since 1955. Other countries have expanded the shipbuilding. So Britain could really say, well, we haven't expanded the policy, so we shouldn't be criminalizing us. And they didn't have to be fair. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, if there's something else I can come back on. Yeah. Uh, yeah I think early in you, I may have misheard you, but I think you said that there was some sort of national shipbuilding company in the first world war. Yeah. Is Stop. That, yeah. 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 Yeah, the standard ship building country, Sorry. the standard ship building standard country to... at uh, Chepstow on the well side of the river. Yeah. Was that the merchant ship? Yes, the merchant ship. So, yeah. so it's a bit like limited ships. Yeah. Well, yes and no. Yeah. Uh, in the sense of mass production, attempt sort of mass production. It was an attempt at clean fabrication and minimum factories, and they were sent there to be. Uh, to be assembled, yeah. They didn't launch a ship before the end of the war. Across the great <laughs> It was then sold to the, excuse me, it was then sold to the Monmouth Shipbuilding Company after it was sold to Fairfield Shipbuilding because it became a bridge building yard, not a shipyard, yeah. He's civil engineering. Yeah? There were two other national shipyards, Port Brave. The idea was, you know, we're going to have to build more because of the new yeah. So, yeah. do you think the British supply companies are pretty steady and the equipment manufacturers? Uh, they, there was an intervention fund, they increased their prices. Well, normally it was decreased prices. <laughs> There wasn't any sort of coordinated supply chain. Of course, inflation at 26% ruins everything. Your prices are going up on a daily basis, basically. Yeah. How can you plan ahead? Yeah. You, you know, this is an example of uh, when Poland built two Polish, the Polish shipyard actually built two clay ferries. Because you had to tend them. Under European Commission rules, they have a What they didn't tell me was there was a huge amount of ship play left over from communism. Mm -hmm. So they used that and it cost them next to nothing. So that's why they could undercut it. And shipyards were generally, as you know, really pretty loath to keep large stocks of ship plates. Yeah. Um, in the old days, they were just rusty as hell. Then the oil majors said, or lots of short lasting of plates because that will make it easier to paint the property, etc. And the shipyards were reluctant them. Did short lasting, etc. etc. But you had to really drag them to do anything which should improve how they did things in the past. They were really largely stuck in the moment. And then Japan, of course, had far more graduates employed in shipyards in Britain. Britain, you'd be lucky to have two in the yards, and they were normally the naval aspects of the chief craftsmen. Yeah. And, uh, uh, university people were treated with suspicion, basically. 
Certainly, I think you'll probably say that some yards were less worse than others. Yes. If they, the government had just said no, no nationalisation, no sorts of things. Give like AMT, split up possibly, and put over. I don't know. It's a small output, a small portion of Would they, would they have survived? Would some industry have survived? No, not in the mercantile side. On the warship side, because it's in perfect competition, the government are based in Rotary, they also <coughs> And from 1972 onwards, it was playing the Yarrow, Bospa, and Vickers were the preferred builders, yeah. which really left hardly in the world Swan Hunter and Scott Lifton. They eventually started building Royal Fleet and Zillary stuff, and rubbish, yeah, to mercantile standards. Because Warship standards are kind of more complicated than the standard warship ship. You know? uh, so they could lose, and they were the main people, uh, Vickers, Bosper, and uh, Yarrow, who were post nationalisation. Well, they would, wouldn't they? Yeah. yeah. But uh, by 1990, it's gone. You were basically left with Ferguson, Port Glasgow. A very small mercantile builder, only able to build ferries and Apple Door and Devon, yeah. And the uh, Carmel Well and Vickers, but Carmel Well is not a big Because that's very quick demise in the thing from leading the world in 1913 to Oxford. Okay, I, I think we need to, to, to wrap things up. There's a there's a comment here by, by Dean about incentivizing uh, young naval engineers along the, the, the model of a US uh, Corps of Army engineers. And there's another comment um, here about uh, British private firms uh, remaining highly decentralized, uh, which in the in the 1990s meant that they were adept at chopping themselves. Uh, uh, to be passed between diversified conglomerates, a depressing, a depressing sort of uh, comment. But um, I, 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 rather than rather I'll go replying to those uh, publicly, I think we'll just, uh, yeah. you know, thank, thank, thank you for, for that. Um, thank you uh, at home, I guess. Although next time I want better from you, I want <laughs> some, uh, some, some less shy participation from the online uh, lot, please. But thank you for coming in in such numbers. Uh, for what is actually, you know, quite quite an important first lecture, not just because uh, it's the first one back uh, in, in 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 person uh, uh, of, of a sort, but because this is, as I as I said at the start, the first Peter Davis Memorial Lecture, and to me uh, that's uh, very important. Uh, the next seminar <clears throat> was planned always to be an entirely online one, so in two weeks' time we have Sam Sam McLean. Uh, on the 10th of February, and on the on the um, outline of, of um, papers that I circulated, I said something very strange. It struck me as very strange uh, this morning when I read it again. That this seminar will be delivered remotely from Canada, which it will, though it may still be attended in person at King's. And I think I imagine people coming in here and seeing a, a, a paper delivered remotely, and that seems like a mad idea, and, I, and we won't do that. So that will be entirely online as we've been doing it. And then on the 24th of February, we'll have Misa Edwards, uh, where we'll do this again. And I'm hoping uh, that as many people who as can fit into the room uh, will be uh, allowed in. But more importantly, uh, it's time I think to thank uh, you for a wonderful start to a new thank era. You. Thank you. Thank you.